Silicate minerals are the most important mineral group on Earth. They make up 25% of all known minerals and 40% most the common. Also known as the rock forming minerals, silicates must have silicon and oxygen incorporated into their chemical structure to be called a silicate. Without silicates, there wouldn't be any computers, no buildings, not even an Earth. This is because Silicates make up a majority of Earth's crust and mantle. Silicates can be classified into five different classes shown here. First, there's the olivines, then the peroxines, amphiboles, micas, and the feldspars. We'll go into detail about each different group, but first let's talk about what makes a silicate a silicate. It all starts with the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. This is the basic building block of all silicates. One small silicon 4 plus cation will sit in the center of this molecule. Its positive charge attracts four nearby negative oxygen atoms. These oxygen atoms will surround silicon in a tetrahedral or pyramid-like structure, as above. Each silicon and oxygen, when bound together, creates a very strong bond. Um, each bond is partially covalent and partially ionic, making them um, strong enough to keep Earth's crust from falling apart. Um, each silicon cation will take one of the two electrons present on each oxygen that it's bound to, leaving the silicon te oxygen tetrahedron with an overall charge of negative four. This negative four charge is what allows other cations like iron or calcium or magnesium to bind to, other to the tetrahedron. This is because the tetrahedron wants to balance out to zero rather than that negative four charge. Polymerization occurs when one tetrahedron binds to another tetrahedron via those oxygen atoms. You may have noticed on the other slide how different each mineral group looked. This is all due to polymerization. Polymerization is what allows the silicates to take on a wide variety of physical appearances while maintaining similar chemical compositions. There are five types of tetrahedral arrangements, four of which form from polymerization. The simplest arrangement is the isolate or independent arrangement. This occurs when the silicate tetrahedron will only bind to metal cations like calcium or magnesium. There's no polymerization here because no tetra other tetrahedrons are involved. The next one is called the single chain structure. This occurs when two oxygen atoms from each tetrahedral bind together and this uh, creates this long single chain like structure. The double chain is very similar to the single chain, except now on every other silicon oxygen tetrahedral, three oxygens are shared instead of two. So it'll alternate two, three, two, three, etc. This creates a wider uh, double chain feature. The next is the sheets uh, arrangement. This is when three oxygens are shared on every tetrahedron. And as you may have guessed, the framework is when all four oxygens on every silicon oxygen tetrahedron are shared. This is the most complex of all the arrangements because it creates a three-dimensional structure, whereas the previous arrangements only had were two-dimensional. Tetrahedron arrangements are how silicate minerals are primarily classified. Minerals with an isolate tetrahedral structure are known as the olivine group. They are known as uh, ferromagnesium silicates, meaning that the cations that commonly bind to the silicate uh, oxygen tetrahedron are iron and magnesium. Since there's no polymerization and only those strong silicon oxygen bonds, there is no point, weak structural points that uh, can be easily cleaved into. The olivine group makes up most of the Earth's mantle, usually in the form of mafic and ultramafic igneous rocks. Pictured here is olivine. Note that deep green color like an olive. This is indicative of a high magnesium iron ratio. Darker minerals would indicate um, a flip-flop of this ratio where iron is higher than magnesium. The peroxine group are single chain ferromagnesium silicates. 
where in addition to the iron and the magnesium cations, calcium cations will commonly bind to each tetrahedron. The bonds in between the tetrahedron are pretty weak compared to those silicon oxygen bonds. This allows cleavage parallel to each sheet. There are two major cleavages in uh, peroxine occurring at 90 degrees uh, from each other vertically. They make up Earth's mantle like olivine, but nowhere near as frequent. They are commonly seen in igneous rocks and are predominantly dark in color. Double chain silicates belong to the amphibole group. They're very similar to the peroxine group, where they both bind to iron, magnesium, and calcium. They both commonly form igneous rocks, and they even look similar in appearance. But the amphibole's double chain structure allows two more types of cations to bind to the tetrahedrons, aluminum and sodium. The main distinguishing feature between the two, um, between amphibole and peroxine, is the difference in their vertical cleavages. Since the double chain structure is wider than the single chain, the vertical cleavages must be as well. So instead of being perpendicular to each other, amphibole's cleavages occur at 120 degrees away from each other. Amphiboles also come in a variety of colors, and hornblende is the most common mineral out of this group. The micas have the sheet tetrahedron arrangement and are the last group considered to be ferromagnesium silicates. Lithium ions will now bind to that tetrahedron in addition to the other cations like iron, magnesium, calcium, etc. This is where it gets a little complex because an aluminum 3 plus ion will often substitute for that central silicon cation in the, each tetrahedron because they're so similar in size and in shape. Um, this causes a charge imbalance in between each sheet. Potassium ions will try to uh, balance out each sheet by binding in between each tetrahedral sheet. Um, these weak potassium bonds allow uh, mica to have perfect cleavage um, and large crystallization. Uh, since the potassium only binds in between each sheet, cleavage can only occur parallel to them. The two most common minerals in this group are biotite and muscovite. Biotite, it, a darker mineral, is uh, rich in iron and is found in rocks associated with that, while muscovite is a sand-colored rock uh, mineral and is all is commonly found in plutons or plutonic rocks. I wanted to go on a brief tangent to talk about the mineral clay. Although it has a sheet structure consistent of the mica group, it's actually not considered a mica. Um, and this is because water is actually in clay's atomic structure where micas don't have any water. This water will actually lubricate each tetrahedral sheet making it flexible and pliable to the touch. Once the water evaporates, however, the clay will become hard and rigid. Um, and if it helps, think of how clay is used in pottery. When we're working with clay, you often have to add water to it to make sure that it doesn't dry up and become hard to work with, right? Well, it's not only until after the clay is fired in a kiln that the clay becomes the hardened finished product. And the last but most important silicate group that we'll discuss are the feldspars. Feldspar minerals have that three-dimensional complex framework tetrahedral structure. They're responsible for a majority of Earth's crust, so it makes sense that they are the most common silicate group found on Earth, as well as the most overall common mineral group. They are the only non-ferromagnesium silicates using either potassium, calcium, or sodium for those cations. Feldspars that bind to potassium uh, cations are known as K feldspars, where those that use sodium or calcium are known as plagioclase feldspars. The plagioclase feldspars are usually a little bit more grayscale than the K feldspars. Like micas, Feldspars experience those charge imbalances when uh, aluminum replaces the central silicon atom. 
that aluminum substitution is key here because although feldspars have the most complex tetrahedral structure, making them very stable, the aluminum substitution and therefore those weak bonds allows two strong 90 degree cleavages in between each feldspar. Similar to clays and micas, we have another exception to the rule for feldspars, quartz. Pure quartz has that framework structure like feldspars, but is only made of silicon and oxygen with no aluminum substitutions to that silicon ion. So each silicon is strongly bound to four oxygen atoms, leaving an overall net neutral charge. No charge in strong bonds makes quartz immune to cleavage with no overall weak structural points. This results in quartz being very resistant to weather, making it a suitable and extremely common mineral in Earth's crust. Quartz is so common that it's found in all three rock types, sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic. Pure quartz has a translucent color seen here, but even just the slightest trace of an impurity can cause quartz to change color. You know that highly valued gem amethyst? It's actually just impure quartz. There's even a variety of quartz known as smoky quartz that happens when there's radioactive damage to that crystal structure.